Hey there, you are, Team Healthy. Good day to you. You know, I enjoy uh, when I, right before I jump on here, I'll, I'll enjoy watching your live chat before we actually start. Some of you are on there pretty good. Uh, by the way, those of you who are uh, watching us take delay, uh, know that you can, do, you can do it live if you want to, and then you can kind of jump in here with all the chat uh, that some of the team healthy people do. Notice uh, some of you talking about line dancing and uh, other uh, kind of, uh, Irish and Scottish dancing. Uh, go, go get them. About the only time I ever dance is at a wedding. And I think the last one I did was a couple of years ago. Um, you don't want to be on the dance floor with me unless you just want to be entertained by, for all the wrong reasons, you know, but it's, it's fun. Good, good for you. Hey, a couple of, um, notes here before we jump into our uh, topic here today. Uh, first, thank you. Uh, thanks to you who attended the, uh, the deto decoding darkness, uh, well, workshop or webinar that I had yesterday. Uh, I had a really good time doing it. We got real good feedback, and I hope it's something that is meaningful for individuals who are stuck with the uh, malignant narcissist, sociopath, and uh, psychopath. Uh, and and I, I'm I'm going to keep doing some of those webinars here and there just to kind of uh, hone in on some difficult topics. Also, some of you have been asking about Gus. A couple of weeks ago, I mentioned that he had been uh, receiving treatment for a pinched nerve in his uh, back and his spinal cord. And uh, we've been doing this laser treatment. And I'm sure enough, it's worked. As of last Friday, he was dismissed. And so Gus is back all the way. Uh, I, I noticed here, uh, Thrash Metal even referred to Gus as being a uh, rap scallion. <laughs> yeah, maybe he is a rap scallion. I don't know. Uh, but he can, he's running around and doing his thing, being his Gus. Uh, I, I don't have him on the live feeds here because uh, he is, after all, a terrier, as a terrier uh, mutt. Um, and if, if some noise is going on outside, he might start barking. And so we don't want that when we're on live here, do we? Okay, here we go. Uh, we, we love us some Gus, though, uh, don't we? All right. Um, you know that I like to come up with a theme with some of the uh, questions that are coming in. And today, the question that I ask is, do narcissists care if they continue to repeat the same old problems? And of course, most of you know the answer to that. No, not really. It's amazing to me, you know, the old uh, definition of insanity. You keep doing the, uh, the same old thing over and over, hoping it's going to give you better results. And narcissists will repeat their same old dysfunctional patterns, thinking, well, if I can just continue being what I am, then other people are going to be impressed and it's going to work out well for me. I don't care about them. When in fact, no, all you're doing is perpetuating your own dysfunction and yet they keep doing it and uh, they don't learn that part of uh, the thing that we know is uh, uh, adjacent to narcissism is the, uh, the unwillingness to take responsibility for themselves, which means that in order first to take responsibility for yourself, you have to first admit that you have a problem and narcissists don't do that. And so as a result, you're going to see the same patterns over and over. And it's like, I, I think I've heard this song and verse so many times over and yet they keep doing it. So with no further ado, let's just dive in with our questions. Know that if you have any questions for uh, uh, for next week, go ahead and put them in, uh, in the comment section below and uh, I'll pick up on them and then I'll pick up on some questions that you might have on other videos as well. And we'll just dive into it the next time uh, we get together. Okay, this first person, and I wanted to lead with this one because it's one that I uh, experienced quite often in my therapy office before I retired. This person says, what can you do if a person who doesn't have a clue about how harmful they are goes to a counselor and convinces them that you were the narcissist? He tells the counselor about your reactions to their gaslighting, stonewalling, back and forth support and criticism. He tells the counselor these things to make himself appear as an innocent victim. <laughs> okay, let me just pause on that. Uh, the good news is, at least for uh, those who are associated with the narcissist, over the years, I've kind of gotten pretty good at being able to spot, you know, we just uh, put it like, say it like it is, a BS artist that shows up in my counseling office. There are times when folks will come in and inevitably when I begin to uh, first get to know them, I'm going to find out some of the strains that other people have uh, and uh, create and perpetuate in their life. And so, yeah, I'll, I'll hear stories about how crummy this person is that they live with or engage with, but healthy individuals will eventually say, you know, I know that those other individuals are, um, are being very difficult, 
But the reason I'm here is because I'm trying to figure out my um, responses to that. I know there are times when I may not be healthy or I may not be uh, as appropriate as I need to be. And I know I get triggered and I want to make sure that I am, uh, am maintaining my side of the street cleanly, knowing that I'm going to continue with these individuals. Healthy individuals eventually will come back to themselves and they say, I've got some work to do. Okay, so you have this uh, this lady whose husband goes and says to the counselor, well, you know what? At home, it's just really rotten. I've got this uh, wife over here and she just doesn't do anything right. And, and uh, you know, she uh, she doesn't always communicate really well. He conveniently forgets that, that uh, he uh, sets up really lousy communication practices. So uh, this person goes on and said, uh, I suppose I should just let go of it and go through the process of pain and healing. Maybe I should just remind myself to stop trying to vindicate myself since he doesn't seem interested in the truth. Okay, you know that I mentioned to you, uh, you collectively team healthy, that sometimes when you ask these questions, you start giving yourself the correct answer as you ask the question, and that's exactly what this lady's doing. So she has a husband who goes to a therapist and the therapist tries to make himself out to seem like this poor little innocent victim. She knows that he's a, a coy, manipulative person behind the scenes. He doesn't seem to uh, remember that part when he talks to the therapist. What's going on? Well, first, I, I find it amazing uh, you know, when you think, well, what motivates someone to go to a therapist when they're going to go in there and be dishonest? or give only partial truths. You know, what, what is their reasoning? And, and there are plenty of uh, people that'll do that. Sometimes this represents that narcissistic person getting ahead of the posse. They know that you may be onto them and they know that uh, you may say, hey, your rages are terrible or your uh, dismissive attitudes are not at all helpful or uh, you have a hate for me, but then uh, you have a, a lot of conflict with a whole lot of other individuals. They, they know that there are some, uh, some elements like that. So they're thinking, well, wait a minute. What if I go to a therapist and I explain to the therapist my circumstances, of course, according to me. And in the end, I get to go home maybe after two sessions or 14 sessions or whatever number it is and tell all the people that need to know the therapist thinks I'm a pretty good person. And I have heard that now uh, that the uh, variations of that so many times, um, I recall uh, talking with a guy who uh, had had a longstanding extramarital affair and he went to a therapist and the therapist tried to, uh, to work things through with him to figure out why he was so vulnerable to that. And one of the things that he uh, walked away with, he said, you know, that therapist really likes me and that therapist is really kind to me. And um, he understands me in ways that my wife doesn't. Now, what he was doing was he was taking the therapist's um, pleasant demeanor as um, some sort of validation. Well, yeah, my wife gets mad because, you know, I had a, an affair for several years. <laughs> Imagine that. The therapist likes me. And, and, and they'll take the kindness or the goodness or the helpfulness of a therapist, and they can twist it to whatever kind of uh, narrative they want. And so many of them are thinking, well, I've been to therapy. And uh, the therapist told me I was okay. And the, the partner at home may be thinking, but there are so many ongoing patterns here that you're not addressing. Um, one of the things that I, uh, that is um, most common with narcissists, why, you know, why they're so resistant to input is a long time ago, they uh, threw up a shield of defense around themselves thinking, I don't know that it's ever going to work out well for me to receive input from someone who's going to tell me that I'm doing things wrong because perhaps in their past, it was uh, done in a condemning or a harsh or a, a mean spirited kind of way. And so it's like, I'll just solve that problem. I won't take input. Um, and uh, uh, even when you come across and you say things in a very good and constructive fashion, there's still that fear factor where it's like, I'm really kind of afraid of what I might learn about myself. And so they, they've got all of this rationale going on inside. And so it's, uh, their um, uh, approach towards problem solving is to say, well, if I have a problem, then it probably is you. And so they go into that. 
Another issue is that when narcissists come in front of a therapist or anybody else for that matter, and they pronounce themselves to be a whole lot better than what they really are, a lot of times they actually literally forget that they're wearing a mask. If they ever believe that they're wearing a mask in the first place, the mask of their false self, their mask of defensiveness has been on and has been on so tight that the mask becomes their reality. And that's so essential for you to understand that when, when we say that they have a low level of awareness, um, they, they've so bought into their own false narrative that false becomes true. And then you come along and say, well, let me explain some things to you. It's like, but I already know everything I need to know. And, and so that, that's why people like me say that it can be very difficult for narcissists to change because the, the reason they've uh, become so defensive and they have uh, uh, lived behind the mask of the false self is so multivaried and, and it, they feel a strong need to keep that mask on that, uh, that even when they are in the presence of a therapist can say, hey, look, we don't need to wear masks here. We can just go ahead and be honest. It's like, uh, uh, I'm not wearing a mask. And then they just keep on. That's what they do. And so, yes, uh, when you see that, then uh, it's, it's your reminder of saying, I'm going to need to uh, to move forward with this husband, knowing that he's not capable of taking the mask off. What does that mean for me? And make your decision accordingly. All right. This is another one where you see in, in someone else uh, what they won't see for themselves. This person asked the question, what can I tell my friend the next time she gets shame slammed by her husband. She overpraises him and waits on him, etc. I know that she'll be calling soon because they're going on a, a vacation together soon. I want to say, stop over inflating his ego. The only time she listens to my advice is after he has discarded her. It's not sinking in though. Would it be best if I said nothing? Uh, and the answer to, again to that last question, you're thinking, well, maybe I'm just, maybe I just need to accept the truth that she doesn't want my input. Would it be best that I said nothing? It may be that ultimately that becomes your answer. Yeah, maybe I just don't need to say anything. Now, the the I, I'm not going to go quite that far to say just don't even say anything. But there's a reason that that narcissistic husband picked your friend as a partner. Apparently, he thought that she would be gullible enough or pliable enough that he could have his way with her. And then there's a reason that she seems to stick with him, despite the fact that he's constantly shame slamming, slamming her. And uh, there's something going on. There's a uh, there's a secondary gain, apparently, that she has for sticking around. And sometimes it's going to take uh, the uh, the efforts of a seasoned uh, therapist or someone who's very attuned to, uh, to that circumstance and uh, help that, uh, that friend of yours decipher what's going on. Now, she can come to you and say, I don't like it that he's treating me poorly. And uh, you can take that as a notion that says, oh, good, she wants to change. But the fact that she just keeps going back over and over and over after she's complained and moaned and groaned about how mean he is and how in, uh, inappropriate he is says, well, apparently she's just not ready. And people do have uh, different um, time frames that are required for them to become ready. And uh, one of the, the greatest dilemmas that you or I can have is in knowing that's uh, that you can see some dysfunction in someone else and you can see that there's a much better way of, of managing that dysfunction. But then you also realize, but you don't want to do it, at least not right now. I, I remember one man, he had come to see me. Uh, his, his wife had sent him in to see me and uh, he had all these anger issues and all the rest. And uh, uh, he, he came in three or four times and he just said, Hey, look, doc, I know that you're a really nice guy, but, um, uh, you know, I, I don't really feel like I need to come in. And he just, he's quit coming just a few times about a year later, I get a phone call and it's him. And he said, uh, Hey doc, you remember me? And I said, Oh yeah, I remember you. He said, uh, I need to come back in and talk with you again. Well, he did. And he had the same issues that he had had the year prior but he just told, he told me, he said, you know, when I first came in, I was here because my wife was making me come. Now I'm here because I want to be here. 
And, and then he just, he, well, he had, uh, went to a level of honesty and self-disclosure that he certainly didn't show that first go round. Sometimes people have different, um, uh, frames of reference that, uh, that they have to go into first before they're going to get to that readiness factor. Uh, if I'm you, I would, uh, and if this friend is someone whose uh, friendship you truly treasure, I'm going to let her know I'm, I'm concerned that, uh, that you have these, these hurts and this pain between yourself and your husband. And this isn't anywhere close to the same, uh, to the first time it keeps happening over and over. I'm going to be here and love you and be, uh, uh, be on board with you, but please know that, uh, it, it bothers me that I'm kind of hearing the same thing over and over. And I know that you're returning to the same patterns over and over. The narcissist may be stuck in their own patterns, but I'm afraid that you're stuck with them too. And then you wait. And like I say, if the relationship is meaningful, then maybe six months or a year or five years down the road, that, uh, that friend may come to you and say, you, uh, you remember those discussions I had? I wasn't ready then, but I'm ready now. And so uh, I do employ a type of patience um, and, uh, you know, banging someone over the head saying, you need to get in there and you need to tell him this probably isn't going to work. Expressing your concern, expressing the fact that you see it uh, is enough. And then when she says, um, okay, well, I don't want to look at it or implies that uh, you stay patient as long as um, uh, the relationship means something to you. That would be my approach in something like this. Another person asked, um, Dr. C is not liking to admit that they don't know something, a trait of a narcissist. <laughs> and the answer is yes. Um, the, so uh, when, when a narcissist is at a place where they kind of have to expose their ignorance, it's like, uh, I don't want anybody to know that I don't know everything. And so is not wanting to admit that a part of it. it's like, yeah, they, they just, again, that false self, I, I need to appear more smarter than I actually am. Okay. And then this person kind of throws a little twist on the question. This person says, I've noticed that if this person asked me a question and when I honestly uh, say, I don't know the answer, they get upset and agitated with me. And then uh, um, th this person says, uh, I found out later that it was to look knowledgeable to someone else. So first, this uh, this person is saying, I have this narcissist in my life um, who um, who doesn't like to admit their own faults. And then when I admit my faults, they get agitated. Uh, and yet when we're in public, they don't want me to look as though I have faults at all. And what we have here is uh, the, the narcissist showing, hey, look, I'm deeply committed to phoniness, okay? Now, behind the scenes, there may be something entirely different, but uh, phoniness, chameleon, uh, uh, way of, of living, that's me. Now, actually, they're not saying those words out loud, but that's what it implies. And so um, when that person is with you behind the scenes, uh, it's like... Uh, I don't, I don't like all your problems. I don't like the fact that you uh, don't know certain things. I don't like the fact that you're ignorant about some things. So they can grouse, grouse and complain. But when you're in public, it's like, hey, look, I'm committed to phoniness. And since you're standing next to me, you need to be the, committed to the same phoniness. And somehow that invalid, excuse me, that validates them. And so they're asking you to join them in their dysfunctional way of presenting themselves publicly. And if you want, you can say, well, okay, I guess I'll do that. <laughs> For me, it's like, no, I don't want to do that. Uh, I don't mind saying I don't know about something. Uh, I might learn more when I, I, I take that approach. The narcissist is like, well, that, that's going to that's gonna blow my cover. Okay, well, your cover is not the same as my cover. And so uh, I just really think that that person is superimposing their coping skill, if you want to call it that, onto you and uh, see it for what it is and just be glad that you can be honest. I mean, for crying out loud, even if you had a IQ of 140, which means you're in Mensa, there's still going to be some things you don't know. <laughs> it's okay to say that. Um, but only phonies can say, but, but I need to, I, I need to pretend like I know everything. Well, you don't. Yes, I do. Oh, well, you don't. Okay. <laughs> Okay, now here's here's another per, uh, person asking of a, a question of a similar nature. 
This person says, I know nearly everyone projects. Okay. In other words, sometimes we see the problems that are in our lives and we see it in other people where it may or may not really be there. Okay. I know nearly everyone projects. I'll, I'll grant you that. But I wonder if there's an especially high comorbidity of narcissism and projecting. Now, do you know what the word comorbidity means? It means that you have two elements of uh, dysfunction uh, residing on the inside of an individual side by side, going on at the same time. Co means with, morbidity means bad stuff. Uh, so is there an extremely high comorbidity with narcissism and projection? And the answer is, oh, yes. Um, for the narcissist in my life, projecting onto me her own issues is a constant, is what this person is saying. So uh, keeping in mind that uh, actually this projection is, is baked into the pattern of narcissism. One of the things that we say is that narcissists have such a, uh, a fear of being known. They have such a fear of being exposed that they, uh, they can't say, you know, I'm struggling. Or uh, I, I need to take responsibility for myself. Now, what they'll do is they'll see in other individuals, that's what projection is, the, the issues that they don't want to come to terms with inside themselves. So they can, uh, let's say you have a, a friend who's highly critical. They just gripe and complain about who knows what. And then they come home from a, a social setting. And they uh, say to you, I tell you what, I was at this social gathering and <laughs> all these critical people were surrounding me. I just can't stand being around those kind of people. That's projection. They see in others what they don't want to come to terms with inside themselves. And um, narcissists are so externally um, based with respect to their sense of well-being. Uh, when I say externally based, if you think well of them, then they're okay that they have not really developed an internally based sense of confidence. In other words, my self-esteem comes from uh, knowing my dignity and living into my integrity and, and understanding the meaning of love and goodness and decency. Uh, they're thinking, no, uh, my life goes well when the external world goes well. And so uh, they'll uh, see in you your faults because it means you're not propping them up right as opposed to saying, well, whatever's going on out there, I need to look in here. So uh, narcissism and projection go hand in hand uh, in a much, much higher uh, percentage of cases than the average Joe or Jane out there. So you're on to it. And some of the folks uh, may have uh, picked up a new word when they think about comorbidity. Okay. Thank you for that question. Okay. Now this one, um, this is, a, this is a, a, a tough one because you see something in the narcissist that they keep repeating that the narcissist won't go into. This one says regarding malignant narcissists, how is it that they, that, that these same cold and heartless and scheming folks can love their children and be as protective as, of them as they are uh, a, 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 in the same way as normal and caring people? How can they be totally conscienceless uh, with regard to other people and yet protective and caring of their own flesh and blood? So in other words, the malignant narcissists can be mean and harsh and scheming with everyone out there, but at home, they, uh, they treat their own children in a very special kind of way. Um, this isn't the case with every narcissist, uh, because sometimes when that narcissist comes home and they got the kids there, the spouse or other family members, maybe, uh, they, they just can't keep up the act forever. And so they just unload all their garbage at home too. Some narcissists though have decided, well, I, I need, I need, um, I, I'm the general and I need colonels and captains on my team. And so they want to take their kids, especially their kids, and turn them into mini me's. Uh, it's like, well, if I can get my son or my daughter to buy into everything that I'm saying, I win. And so obviously they have them literally from day one. And many times, whether uh, it's conscious or not, the narcissist will spend virtually the entire childhood with that kid brainwashing them. Um, you're special because you're an extension of me and, and they can be very kind and helpful and, uh, especially attentive. And usually they, uh, are, they tend to go overboard and giving them nice things and being uh, very, uh, 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 complimentary towards them. And I, I, I could sit here and just count numerous uh, examples of how that works. 
And then uh, when they're with other individuals who are not that son or daughter, they just be mean as a snake. And, and basically uh, th there's a, there's a phrase that this person used. Uh, this person says, um, how can they be protective of them in the same way as normal caring people? That, that phrase as normal caring people, they're not, they're not doing it the same. It looks the same but they're doing it for very different reasons. There, uh, there's a thing that we refer to as narcissistic grooming. Now on a, uh, on an adult, uh, I, I'm still struggling with some of my uh, throat issues. If you, I haven't noticed that, uh, on an adult level, narcissists, let's say they're 40 years old and they, they have someone new, they'll try to groom them and they'll try to say, Oh, you're such a nice person. They'll be friendly and kind and all the rest. Um, uh, but, um, it, it's, it's a ruse. Because it's their way of saying, well, if you see me as being a really nice person, then I can just slip in. And when the time comes, I can be as controlling as I want because I now have a reputation of being a really nice person. So they groom people. And so they're, uh, what they're, their goodness, unfortunately, can be a phony front. With, you know, with kids, though, they can give the appearance that they're being normal, but it's a grooming process. And the narcissist has the advantage of, say, of uh, thinking, well, and I got them literally from day one uh, on ground zero. So uh, when, when you see that in play, a person is mean, mean to uh, people in public, but then they're doting towards their own kids and loving. Um, trust me, it's a, uh, it's, it's a ruse uh, to them, for them to get many me's in place. And then typically that child can grow up and be either just like them or the child can grow up and eventually think, Hey, wait a minute, I was played. And sometimes they can blow and go into the opposite direction, but just know what you're dealing with. You're, you're, um, you're um, uh, seeing the, the malignant side of the narcissist is not false. The falseness is coming from the way they manage themselves with their own kids. Okay. Uh, another person asked the question, my wife keeps making excuses for her mother who is off the charts narcissistic. My wife is otherwise pleasant, but I don't get why she has to talk me into seeing her mother as something she is not. That's a great question. Uh, so when he says mom is off the charts, narcissistic, that tells me that we're not dealing with so much with covert. Uh, now, maybe in public, that mother-in-law can be, you know, friendly with some people. But I, I'm, I'm assuming that she's, uh, uh, this mother-in-law is highly controlling and demanding and has the agenda and it's all very self-serving. And here the husband has walked into this new family situation. I don't know if they've been married three years or uh, 32 years. I'm not sure, obviously. Uh, and he's, uh, he's thinking, hey, wait a minute. I smell something fishy here. And, uh, and he, he's able to see what's glaringly obvious. Why is it that the wife cannot see what the mother is all about? And the answer may be, maybe she does see it. But maybe in her own mind, it's like, well, if I call my mother out for being uh, overbearing or harsh or critical, I might not have a mother. Might there be that? Might it be that she's embarrassed by her mother? Might it be that, uh, that she's just a shallow person and doesn't have good uh, insight skills? Might it be that she is afraid of the mother? And I'm going to lean more in that direction. If I do stand up to my mother when she's being highly insensitive, I'm afraid that she's going to put her venom on me and this adult daughter can revert to a nine year old state of mind thinking, I don't want my mommy mad at me. And so apparently the, uh, the wife can be, um, can have her own reasons for not wanting to say, you know, I have the unfortunate situation of having a highly controlling and overbearing and insensitive mom. And I know it has lots of repercussions for my husband. Uh, it's like, no, um, the, the brainwashing was probably pretty thorough in her, in the wife, in the daughter. And uh, it's like, I'm, again, we go back to, I'm not ready to, uh, to see what you see. And so if you see it, then uh, that's going to be your thing. It doesn't sound like uh, they have all this, uh, this much strain and tension once mother-in-laws are not, not around, but uh, she's not in a ready position. And, and I take the position that says, well, I'll do what I need to do in my relationship with that, in this case, that mother-in-law. And if my wife is not ready to, uh, to take the same steps, that's where she is. 
uh, and and you can't really force somebody to uh, to see something they're not ready to see. Now, obviously, if there are some uh, some major issues that uh, are really really loud, like uh, the mother-in-law is being abusive to the children, for example, or the the mother-in-law is asking the daughter to join her in uh, in hate toward other individuals, then I think it's appropriate to call it out and, and speak up. Uh, but then uh, again. Uh, the readiness factor has to be there. Sometimes if you're on team healthy, you can see things in other individuals that they just simply uh, don't want to see, at least not yet. Okay, now uh, this this next person uses the term uh, vulnerable narcissist and, and uh, from the way the question is positioned, it seems like it's an appropriate use of that term. Um, uh, let me, uh, we're going to, uh, the question has to do with a vulnerable narcissist. Let me, uh, let me explain to you what I mean when I say vulnerable, some, some places you'll see that, uh, when people talk about a covert narcissist, they, they, they just kind of lump it all. And they say the covert narcissist is a, is a vulnerable narcissist. And, uh, and actually, uh, in my way of looking at it, the vulnerable narcissist tends to be a subcategory of a covert narcissism. If we're going to get technical, uh, let, let's, let's dive in and I'll, I'll let you know what I mean. This person says, can the vulnerable narcissist, because of their depressing mood and their wanting or needing to isolate themselves from another point of view, ever come around? Or is it depression uh, or is it, is it depression or is it their personality? Vulnerable narcissists, um, they, they tend not to be loud and over the top of anything. They tend to be moody and sulky and kind of quiet. And let's suppose that uh, you have a family gathering and you have this one, you know, sister-in-law over here to the side and the sister-in-law is always in a bad mood. Or when you say, well, how's everything going? It's kind of like, mm, okay. And, and so they, they just seem to be committed, you know, the Eeyore uh, kind of mentality. Well, you know, I, I think the sky is going to fall in, but it hadn't done it yet, but it's probably going to. And so they just kind of are sulky and moody. And then when you say, Hey, we've got some great things going on in our world today. It's like, well, uh, you know, the old Debbie Downer. Yeah. But, um, that things aren't so great over here. Now they may not say it, but they, they just exude that, that, that sense of negativity and, and depression. That's the vulnerable narcissist. They just have this, uh, this quiet, uh, I don't think life is going to be all that good kind of mentality and it's their control. And so this person says, uh, they, they want to isolate and all of that. Uh, will they ever come around to me? When you have a, uh, a pattern of life that has strong, passive, aggressive patterns along with it, um, I, I, I tend to hold out a pretty low level of optimism for that. Uh, the passive aggressive is the most difficult uh, or one of the most difficult to deal with simply because they, uh, they, they suppress so much of their real thoughts and feelings. And they, uh, they just simply can't say I'm, uh, I'm bothered by something. There's some assertiveness that I need to take, or I need to talk things out with you. They're just, they, they just kind of uh, uh, stay stuck in that passive aggressive pattern. They just don't come out of it. Um, and the passive aggressiveness basically has three different ingredients with it. It's uh, high control, high fear, and, uh, and then of course the anger. Uh, so these individuals have an anger about life. I don't like the way people are or people bug me. They, they, uh, they bother me, but then they also have a fear. It's like, I don't want to make myself known. Uh, the more I put myself out there, I'm just going to get into arguments that I don't want to be into. And so they stay in control by, you know, by thinking you just won't know me and I'm not going to reveal who I am. And so that's what that vulnerable covert passive aggressive narcissist does. And so, uh, the, the, they, they can be so difficult to, uh, uh, to work with because it's like, I don't need to talk. I, yeah, I'm, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> They'll, uh, misrepresent themselves. My problem is everybody else. And so, uh, they tend to, uh, to deflect and, uh, they're that, that their shield is way too high. So, Good luck in dealing with this. Uh, and again, I come back and say that passive aggressive person tends to be um, so difficult. Uh, their sulking is their control. Does that make sense? It doesn't uh, doesn't seem right, but that's what it is. 
Another person says, hi, Dr. C. Hello. Uh, what about when they don't respond to your text messages or return calls or keep playing the super busy card when clearly they're not that busy? Is that pass a passive aggressive narcissistic tactic? Okay. And the answer is yes. Uh, so here, here we have yet another um, a way of behaving. And we can say that not um, responding to text messages in and of itself. No, that's not on the list of narcissism, but then it's like, but it's constant. They don't, uh, they don't return text messages. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, they don't return phone calls. They're constantly saying how busy they are, even though I find out later on that they have all the time in the world. What you have here is you have a, a disconnect between uh, what they say and what really is. They say, oh, I'm, I'm super busy uh, or I'll get back to you when in fact behavior says, no, you won't. Uh, I'm going to tell you uh, my wife and I, and, and I want to say this may be like a 20, 20, literally a 25 year pattern. There's, there's a, a person we see from time to time and we have multiple connections with this one person who's that quintessential friendly, Hey, we need to get together for lunch, that kind of person. And, uh, whenever we see this one person, uh, she'll, uh, she's very friendly and, and engaging. And then she'll say, uh, you know, we need to get together. And, uh, I, I'd like to have you over for dinner sometime. And, um, 25 years uh, down the road, we haven't been over to her house for dinner or another time we might see him, uh, see this lady. It's like, um, Hey, um, you know, I'm going to be up in your neighborhood here pretty soon. And uh, maybe we can catch lunch. It's like, well, just give me a call. And anytime you see this person's always friendly and always super busy. Got, oh, I got a lot of stuff going on. And it's like, well, 25 years of saying, let's get together. And, and literally, I'll bet you there's been at least 50, 60 times. It's like, well, it hadn't happened yet. And we've made ourselves available. I think we have a trend going on here. What is that all about? Well, clearly that person's lying and they can, they can lie with a smile on their face and they can lie while they're patting you on the back, but they're lying. It's not, I'm not going to do it, but it's important to them to give the impression that I'm one of the nicest and most engaging people you want to know. I just happen to be busy when in fact, no, uh, what they're saying through their behavior, which is different than what they're saying verbally through their behavior is being beholden to people is something that bugs me. Um, being, um, uh, uh, being someone who actually follows through, it's like, well, that that's inconvenient to me. I, I need to be in control. And so I just want to give the impression that I'm really friendly and really engaging, but it's all a lie. And, uh, but I, if I say it with a smile on my face, then, uh, you are going to walk away thinking I'm okay. And I get to walk away thinking I'm okay. And that's how they can uh, rationalize all of this. And so I'm, I'm going to guess, because I know there's going to be a, a situation coming up in the not too distant future where my wife and I are going to see the same person. And I'll bet you we get the same old hug and sweetie and all of this. And we need to get together. And then we're going to chuckle as we walk back into the car. And it's like, well, let's see how uh, let's see how soon we're going to get that phone call for that lunch that we've been asked that told that she's going to call us on. And it's just their way of, uh, of keeping the mask on. And they just simply can't be honest. And if, if, if I were to sit down with this person and say, hey, you know, for 25 years, you've been saying uh, that you want to have lunch and it hadn't happened yet. So uh, stop lying to me. That would be so offensive to that person. It's like, and, and plus, it's just not important enough. It's like, you just go ahead and be you. Uh, but I'm going to do it. And, and I'm not going to get sucked into whatever kind of feel good I'm supposed to have because you're going to have lunch with me one of these years, one of these decades. Okay, another question here. This person says, why do I feel guilty for wondering if my dad was narcissistic? He was a great provider and a nice man, but he had some major red flags. Okay, so now uh, yeah, this, uh, and uh, when you say was, it makes me wonder if he's already deceased. But uh, it's like, you know, looking back, I think my dad was a narcissist. And, and here's the problem. In these days, uh, when we use the word narcissism, uh, there will be a lot of people who will say, well, that's one of the most overused words that we have in our uh, dictionary today. And my response to that is, yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> 
And, uh, you know, guys like me talk into this uh, topic. And when I speak about it, first, I'm, I'm talking about the human condition. We all have some inclination towards control and selfishness and, and entitlement and insensitivity and a lack of empathy. Each one of us can have a propensity toward that. Healthy individuals will say, yeah, I know it. Um, and that being part of the human condition and me being human, I'm going to do something about it. So they do something with it. Others, it's like, yeah, I, if it's there, I'm not going to do anything with it. But then uh, as, as we talk about that word narcissism, instead of us saying, yeah, what it is, it's kind of a shorthanded way of saying that there's a whole pattern of um, pathological characteristics. Uh, we've turned narcissism into an ugly name that we can call somebody that we don't like. And so I, I think this woman's probably gotten caught up in this. Um, and so if I say my dad was a narcissist, it, it just kind of makes it sound like I'm, I'm pulling out that familiar club that other people do and I'm banging my own deceased father over the head with it. Um, but the bottom line is he had a whole lot of red flags. Why do I feel guilty? And it could be that, uh, a, um, you don't want to, to be a part of this, uh, group that just overuses narcissism. But on a deeper level, it could be that uh, for you to say my father was highly narcissistic, which means uh, he didn't really know love very well. He was a troubled soul. It may be that that is such a foreign concept for you that you were never allowed to discuss that with him, that for you now to say, I wish I could, it just feels like you're almost uh, thinking and speaking in a foreign language. And so it just feels odd. And I'm guessing there's uh, very much that uh, element that's in play. Um, we didn't, we weren't really allowed to talk about uh, family patterns. And so now it feels a bit odd for me to say, well, I wish I had that opportunity because, well, he's gone now. And so uh, it, it can feel strange, uh, particularly when certain light bulbs turn on, let's say later in life, like at 58, as opposed to 23. And it's like, I've been doing this for 58 years and, and uh, I'm just now figuring it out. And, and just, just be aware that it may be uncomfortable, uh, but you don't have to use the word narcissism as a club. It's, it's a uh, descriptor of a pattern of life that's built in selfishness and control. Okay, let's uh, let's go with one last question here, and, and this is: uh, What is your take on narcissists who withhold affection, or sex, or closeness? And uh, when I hear this, and this is not at all an, un, an unusual kind of thing, this is yet another illustration of the passive aggressive tendencies that narcissists can have. It's like uh, if I'm in a relationship with you, and we're going to be affectionate with one another, and sexual, and affirming. I'm not doing that. And uh, when you ask why, it's like, eh, I'm, I'm, I'm not in the mood or I don't know. Uh, typically, uh, kindness and affection and affirmation is that person's way of saying, I really like knowing you from the heart level. But the fact that they will choose that as a means of, uh, of, of putting some distance, it's their way of saying, A, I don't like the empathy thing, tenderness, <sighs> That means that I have to become vulnerable. And as a narcissist, I don't want to be vulnerable because that means that you're going to see that I have my frailties or I have my needs or something like that. And I, I don't really like opening up to people like that. And as a result, uh, when they, they just seem to be disinterested in being kind and tender, it's their way of saying, if I approach you in a heartwarming kind of way, then I need to look at me at a heart level. And I don't do that. And again, the shield is so thick and so tall and so lasting that it's like, mm, I'd rather just say I'm busy or I have other things or I'll just kind of make myself unavailable. But what they're doing is they're, it's their ongoing cover up of uh, their fear of their own vulnerability. Okay, so here we see we've got this pattern where do narcissists care if they repeat the same old pat problems? And the answer is, well, they keep doing it. And so there are so many uh, elements that go along with the narcissistic pattern that inhibit an individual from being insightful. And if you're the kind of person that says, well, I like to break things down and I like to, to say, hey, let's let's get down at that heart level and let's be honest with one another. Then it may be that you'll need to find a different person to do that with because the narcissist is like, no, I'm way too committed to my false self. And uh, that's that I'm invested in it. 
And as long as you uh, hang with me, you're going to be disappointed if you want me to be anything other than what I show you. So believe it. All right. Keep bringing the, the questions to you. And by the way, I know some of you may have noticed I've, we've started putting up some shorts on my uh, on my YouTube channel. Uh, so there's a little uh, tab that shows shorts and uh, you might want to pick up on those two. Those are, those are uh, it's kind of a brand new thing we're doing now and we're going to keep doing that for a while. Uh, I so appreciate you allowing me to be on your journey with you. I, I, I take my role in this seriously. I know that so many of you are on a path of healing and I'm honored that you allow me to be on that path with you. So uh, when I say uh, bring your questions in, uh, know that I'm honored that you would do so. I'm so glad that we have Team Healthy where we can encourage each other. I hope you have a good rest of the week and I'll see you next time around. I'll, we'll be back in, in another week doing the same thing. Bye.